welcome back to episode five of the Pixelmator Pro Masterclass, where we've been showing you all of the features that Pixelmator Pro has to offer. This is targeted at beginner or intermediate level photographers, and I've got all the previous episodes, as well as today's photo, linked down below, in case you wanna edit along with me. Today, we're focusing on how you can get five-ish really classic looks, and we're going to combine them in different and interesting ways. Because Pixelmator Pro is non-destructive, you'll be able to toggle and switch between them and really find the one that you like the most. Now, with that said, let's just jump right into the edit. So for this photo, I'm actually gonna pull from my photos library. Now, we recently had the opportunity to go down to Manti, Utah to tour this historic building that recently got renovated. This is the Manti, Utah LDS Temple. Now, for this, because it is a raw photo, it's going to need some help. So I'm gonna just start with an ML Enhance just to get things in a better position. Now, I like this photo a little bit warmer. I think that helps. It's still a little dark, so I'm gonna crank up the brightness and the exposure. Maybe not that much, because I wanna keep some of the darkness in the bushes down below. And then I'm also going to come all the way down here to the curves. And I'm gonna drag down something like that and something like that. I want there to be a lot of contrast between the foreground and the background. And then last of all, I don't love how this tree got in the photo. By the way, this was um, taken out of a moving car. <laughs> Slowly moving, it wasn't that dangerous, but so it's a little blurry and it's not framed perfectly. I'm gonna go something like that. I think that looks a lot better. Okay, now the other thing I'm gonna do because I'm editing on a small screen is I'm just gonna grab this and collapse it. So I just get a little bit more space here. And then I'm also gonna take a look at my luminance. So you can see we've got good separation now between my lights and darks. So really quick before we move on, if all of the adjustments I just made were too much for you, didn't follow along, those are the subjects of the previous video, so go check those out. This takes us to the first part of the edit. Some of you might not know that if you come all the way down to the bottom, we have a bunch of things that we've never seen before, as well as a customize button. Now we don't need all of these. In fact, I'm gonna selectively choose some of these from the bottom that we're gonna focus on today. Specifically, you'll want to enable fade, black and white, color monochrome, sepia, we'll turn off channel mixer, invert, we're gonna turn off LUT, vignette, sharpen, and grain. So that's quite a few. I'm gonna turn off some of these others that I have enabled that we just don't need for today's episode. Okay, so the first thing we wanna look at is fade. What fade does is really simple. It brings your black point up so that your blacks don't get all the way to black and it takes your white point and pulls it down so your whites don't get all the way to white. And this is a really classic vintage photo look. Now, 100% is a lot. You can especially see down here in the bushes, if I zoom in, cranking up the blacks really starts to fade them out. And you can also see on the histogram how much of an effect that has. Now, some Instagrammers really like to get aggressive with this. So I'll go all the way up to 70. I think that that's pretty good. Uh, it's maybe a little strong for my taste, but it fits the type of photo we're looking for. The other is the whites. Now, if you look at the clouds, you can see how they slowly disappear if you go all the way up to 100. I don't love that look. There are old vintage photos that end up having that look, and so go nuts if you like it. But I'm going to keep it maybe somewhere in the 30-ish range. I don't want to get too crazy. Now, let's start defining our look. Now, we have black and white color monochrome, sepia, and invert that are all going to give us a different type of classic photo look. Now, invert is the one that we are going to pay least attention to, so I'm gonna start with it. And the reason why we're paying least attention to it is because it makes it look like a negative of a photo. So to show you what I mean, if I start with a photo negative, I can just drag this over here to Pixelmator, and I can go straight into invert, and that looks pretty bad, and that's because it just needs some color adjustment. Uh, we're gonna, oh, it's inverted, you're right. So let's go backwards. And you can see that it starts to actually look something like a real photo with real colors, right? And so if we want our photo to actually look like a color negative, all we have to do is take a normal photo and turn on invert. And you can even dial in the controls on that too. So if you, if you want it to look like a faded negative or something like that, you can. 
So with all of that explained, we've got one of our potential looks locked in if you want that old film negative look. I'm gonna disable this for now, but this is non-destructive, we can come back to it. The next look we're going to do is sepia. Sepia is also equally simple. It's just an intensity and it makes it look like one of those old cowboy western photos, which, you know, for Southern Utah isn't exactly the wrong look. I kind of like it. I'm gonna turn this off too. We've now got this dialed in the way we like. We've got it in our back pocket. We can turn it on later. Color monochrome, if you like sepia, is like the more powerful version of sepia. Rather than being stuck with a single color, I can come in here and I can get something that looks similar to sepia. I can get something that looks maybe a little darker or desaturated, right? Or if I really want to just change the color up altogether, I can. I personally like something like this. It's a, it's a sepia with a little bit more red and maybe a little bit darker, which gives it a little bit more contrast. And of course, you can dial that in. I'm going to leave it all the way intense. All right. So that is three looks. Again, we'll disable it. It's not destructive. We'll come back to this. Out of the four of these looks though, the black and white is my personal preference. And that is because Pixelmator Pro gives you so many options on how you want your black and white photo to look. So let's take a look at tone to start with. You can see with tone, as I drag it back and forth, it emphasizes different areas of the photos. So you can see that the difference between especially these highlighty parts right here on the grass changes from light to dark as I slide this. So we're gonna use this as our final tuner on the contrast for the overall photo. Now with each of these sliders, I can control how the reds, greens, and blues get converted to black and white. So let's take a look at our reds first. If I drag the reds all the way up, or all the way down, you can see there's not a ton of difference in this photo because they mostly exist in these highlights. For now, I'm gonna leave the reds alone because if you tune all three of these in the same direction, it's almost as if you did nothing at all. So I'm gonna leave red in place and come back to it because it has the least impact so far. With green, let's pull the green left and right. I actually like the green area being a little darker because we want the contrast with the sky and the building above. Now let's take blue. Blue we should have a lot of because it's up in the sky. And you can see it's starting to fade a lot there. I like the brighter version of it because, again, the contrast. All right, now that I've got these pulled in different directions, let's play with the red. Ooh, I like when I take the red and pull it down. It really manifests in these shadows right here. See how that introduces a bunch of contrast? I'm gonna press Command-0 to reset my zoom, and then I'm gonna play with the tone now and see if I can get a version that has a lot of contrast. And when I pull this one this way, you can see it preserves some of these highlights so I don't lose all of my detail down in the bushes, but it also gives me a lot of contrast up here as well. All right, so with the black and white look finished, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off. Again, we can combine these later. It's not destructive. Let's take a look at Vignette, Sharpen, and Green. Vignette is the easiest to understand and I think it's the quickest shortcut to getting an old looking photo because you can see it darkens or, if I pull it the other way, lightens the outside edge of the photos. I'm sure all of you have seen your grandparents' wedding photos that has that like faded look on the outside edges. That's this direction. And any vintage camera, especially if you get into the like 50s, 60s, 70s, probably has some amount of vignette happening right there. And the cool thing is, is I can control both the darkness, right, the exposure level. I'm gonna get it so it's not obvious that there's a vignette applied, right, just a little bit of darken. And I can apply some black point, which is cool because that makes it so that these black points down here get eaten up quicker without really affecting the light areas like the sky, which is nice. Right, I can separate where I'm getting my contrast to come in from. And then last of all, I can control the, the softness. This is hard to see, so let me dial up the exposure here so you can see the softness really goes tight. It's hard. I can loosen that up. I'm gonna keep it nice and soft. I'm gonna put my exposure back. Something about like that. All right. We have a nice vignette. We're gonna keep that for all three of our looks. If you don't like the vignette, you can turn it off later. Sharpen. 
This one's important because this was taken out of a moving car window with an iPhone. The raw iPhone photos tend to have a little bit of issues with sharpness. Now let's start by turning this all the way down. So the first setting is radius. The way you can think about this is as it looks for the edges of things, it is looking to see how far out it needs to sharpen from that edge, which is different from the amount of sharpness that it applies. So for example, if I crank up the intensity here, but I have no radius, it has no effect. But if I have the intensity all the way up, you can see as I slowly turn this up, it starts really sharpening and then you'll notice how it starts to get this bloom effect at different settings of the radius. So with sharpen, you want to be extra careful because you can look really fake really fast. This is one of the areas where beginners make the most mistakes. I'm going to dial it back to just right about here, right where I'm starting to see a hint of this glow around here. And then I'm going to dial my intensity all the way back. Something right about here. I can still see a little too much of the glow. So then I'm going to pull up the radius. This is a balancing act between is it making my image crisper versus making it look fake. Now for this, I think at this zoom level, it's starting to look good. It's just these high contrast areas that I'm going to spot check and make sure you can see there's a little bit happening there too. And if I turn up the radius, it doesn't really help. Same thing. If I turn down the intensity, it doesn't really help. Some of that is just naturally part of the photo. So it's a balancing act. Sharpen, you're always looking at the edges to make sure you've got something that's nice and balanced. Now the last thing is film grain. For those of you that don't know, you're going to get a lot of graininess whenever you shoot on film, and you can determine how big you want those film grain particles to be, or how small you want them to be, and how contrasty you want them to be. I personally like just enough that if somebody looks close, they can tell that they're there, but not so much that they call out, hey, I've got a film grain effect put on me. All right, with that, we have vignette, sharpening, and some grain, and we can play around with our looks. So for example, we can look and see if we like this combined with the sepia, the color monochrome, the black and white, or a combination of them. And you can see how things like the contrast and the dark areas really stack on top of each other when you start applying these effects with each other. So you can even, for example, right, like if you like the black and white and you don't want it to look all the way color monochromed, maybe you just want a little bit of color added back into it, you could do something like that. Personally, I like the black and white as it is. And again, because this is non-destructive, I can come back down here and say, okay, I actually, now that I see this with my vignette, I want to change the exposure even more. I think with black and white, you have a little bit more tolerance. And then I can also go back to my original settings, pressing C and changing my crop a little bit too. I'm gonna to hold shift to keep the original aspect ratio, but you know, get that building centered up nice and my non-destructive edits come along for the ride. So this is what my finished edit looked like. If you followed along, go ahead and tag me on Instagram or share it with me on Twitter and let me know what you got. I'd love to highlight some of your photos as you're following along with me in these lessons. If you found this video helpful, make sure you subscribe so you can stick around for the future masterclass episodes. There's only going to be a couple more before we finish up with the photography adjustments and we're going to move on to some of the other things like text and vector shapes and things like that. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I try to be really active in helping out with people that get stuck anywhere. And if you're excited about the Photomator Masterclass, let me know about that in the comments below too. All right, we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.